If you'd like to see more of the details of individual instances where these costs have hurt countries, uh, or hurt cities, or hurt workers, uh, or individual people, you can watch the videos within the Prezi. Um, it's not necessary, but perhaps it can provide some context. So basically, we've talked about many of the good elements of trade, but obviously, uh, sort of these free trade policies um, need to be looked at with a critical lens because there's two sides to every issue. So we want to be able, at the end of this, understand that there might be some financial costs, uh, some some social costs, and even some costs that are hard to clearly calculate. So I mean, one example would be uh, the use of sweatshop labor. Where a lot of big companies, specifically Nike and other fast fashion companies, have been criticized about this, and they were using it to increase their own profit margin. Uh, so uh, for those who work in those conditions, who are working very, very long hours for minimal wages, they would face uh, a social cost um, because of a situation created by international trade. So financial costs, uh, you know, there could be, uh, sh you know, shipping costs, tariff costs, uh, legal fees, taxes, just production expenses, uh, having to make something overseas. You might have noticed this with PPE uh, in 2020, uh, because a lot of sort of pharmaceutical production, uh, kind of medical production had been offshored from Canada and the US to uh, other parts of the world when we needed stockpiles of that, it was hard to get it quickly. As a result, the PPE that was available uh, was scarce and it was very, very expensive. So, uh, you know, just the expenses of insurance, uh, the expenses of marketing, uh, it, all of these sort of extra expenses that have to be paid to make trade happen are part of the financial costs. You know, here's a bit of a photo of a toll booth. And you can see this is from Sao Paulo, Brazil, but it could be the toll booth anywhere in the world. It could be the U.S. border in Windsor. Uh, the idea is anyone, or it could be the Highway 401 when uh, the uh, traffic is so backed up and delayed due to, to shipping, uh, it, it creates an economic toll on everyone. So there's other costs. Uh, you know, it could be a human rights abuse. Uh, labor conditions, environmental de designate, uh, degradation. Uh, here, a gold mine in 2015 turned part of the Colorado River yellow. We've seen things like strip ponds and uh, tailings ponds that have, uh, you know, had so much uh, chemical in them that uh, for mining that it becomes a real environmental problem. Uh, you know, when people are uh, working in a, an export processing zone uh, for such low wages uh, that they, you know that they still can barely live that becomes a labor abuse and another uh, cost that we need to monitor so obviously you know that's not the uh, color a river should be in some cases the trade happens with uh, areas that are uh, you know, the, the laws are not as strictly enforced. Uh, companies may choose to operate in jurisdictions where there's n not as much environmental oversight and they take advantage of the situation and, and carelessness or a lack of enforcement leads to disasters like this. So if you would like to watch, uh, we all um, have you know, items of clothing that were cheaply made, that were made overseas in other countries and uh you know unfortunately there's a cost to that uh you know a lot of those um were made where, where safety was uh, an issue uh, the rana plaza uh 2013 collapse was the, uh, something that joe fresh and other canadian manufacturers were involved with uh that were just was a lack of safety regulations uh young people working children not going to school but working instead 
you know, heat, uh, excessive heat, accidents, all of some things that have happened that although we're paying a low cost when we go to the mall, others are paying a high social cost. So when uh, companies move their production for part of their goods or all of their goods where labor, sh labor costs are lower, it's known as, as uh, outsourcing. Uh, it can also be called offshoring. Uh, you know, the advantages to doing this would be you're closer to the natural resources. Perhaps that company has more efficient technology, but protect, perhaps there's better innovation, protect, protect, perhaps there's a better tax structure, structure, but quite often it's about finding the lowest wage possible. So a lot of the manufacturing jobs in Canada and the United States that have disappeared in the last 20 years have been due to outsourcing uh, to find a country with a lower wage. You know, there's, uh, it can be good, you know, it's not like any factory in a developing country is a disaster waiting to happen. In many cases, the, uh, the company helps set up the infrastructure for this particular part of the country, and they get roads that they would not otherwise have. They can also, you know, uh, invest in the schools or the hospitals. So uh, they also pay a wage that's much higher than whatever the previous uh, type of employment was. So it's not as if any offshoring is automatically an issue, but it, uh, you know, it is something to monitor because there has been uh, exploitation, uh, physical abuse, sexual abuse, uh, you know, uh, confinement, denial of food, excessive, uh, you know, excessive shift times, the regular employment of child labor, and so that is, is something um, Joe f to be concerned about. Joe Fresh was connected with the poor working conditions. This is this, this huge in Rana Plaza, which was this huge multi-level uh, factory where people were working in close, close quarters, and eventually it collapsed and um, hundreds were killed. So uh, jobs. Uh, often go to the area where there's the lowest wage. So, and to get consumer goods that are cheap, we often patronize companies that have chosen to pay the lowest wages possible. Perhaps even in some cases, refuse to pay wages or refuse to pay overtime or have demanded uh, excessive hours, including unpaid overtime. And uh, when, when this happens, it's like, the wage is like one fifth of what it is in Canada or the US. So that American or Canadian worker needs to become five times as productive to, you know, make it worthwhile keeping the job where it is. And that's, that's just not realistic. So a bit of one solution is to uh, lobby for higher wages around the world, but also just to, if workers in, the, in developed countries were to increase their productivity, that, that would help. But sometimes the wage gap is so lot, lot large, uh, there's just really nothing that the individual worker can do. Uh, you know, in places like Ohio, uh, some of the car plants shuttered and they moved to the northern part of Mexico. And new manufacturing jobs have taken their place. Uh, However, the wages are nowhere near as high as the, the, the before, and it's 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 still uh, you know hard for those uh, people who lost their jobs to uh, maintain their level of income. American Factory is also a good documentary uh, that talks about a glass plant in uh, Indiana that was purchased by uh, a Chinese company and just the differences in safety standards, the differences in wages, the differences in attitudes towards unions between the new owners and the original uh, GM ownership is quite stark. Um, you know, it can be environmental degradation, you know, in terms of pollution while the product's being shipped, but just also uh, these other jurisdictions where the environmental laws are not uh, t taken seriously. So there's been uh, a lot of manufacturing in China, and it's been done at such a high speed that there's, uh, you know, many, many days a year with just so much smog that you can't see uh, clearly in an industrialized area. Uh, it's 
the production relocates towards the cu countries with the lower environmental standards because following the standards is a cost and it raises pollution levels in those areas. Uh, and then it um, also encourages just the consumption of natural resources faster than nature can replenish them. And I think you may have observed with your own electronics how it's just easier to throw something out rather than to try and fix it or to reuse it or to recycle it. And uh, that's uh, happened with all types of natural resources all over the world. So uh, what are some things that companies can do? Well, uh, the concept of sustainable development has become more popular. That is, you know, developing um, the land, the city, the business, the community around the business to meet the needs of the present generation without compromising the future. And and Coca-Cola has, uh, you know, talked about uh, some of their sustainable goals, uh, and that includes uh, looking after water. They do not want to contaminate the water supply. Uh, they've talked about goals uh, to, uh, you know, improve the energy efficiency of some of their coolers and of their, their trucks. They've talked about reducing the amount of packaging because of new innovations, and they've talked about helping uh, farmers with new agricultural styles. So, um, sustainable sustainability is the idea of being profitable now but also committing to some environmental standards for the future fair trade is another um concept that is uh oftentimes there's lots of little farmers that uh sell their natural resources and then a big wholesaler buys it or a big exporter buys it ships it to north america or where it's processed and then we consume it like uh, for example uh, coffee is a big example of this there's all these little uh coffee farmers and uh they don't have any market power the coffee buyers have all of the power so one thing that they uh, they can do is uh, we can put pressure on uh, the companies in North America to use fair trade policies, which is to pay a living wage to the farmers, not to pay the lowest price possible for the bean, but to pay something that is actually um, you know reasonable. Uh, also, you might see that the um, enough farmers get together as a co-op to increase their bargaining power and to demand fair trade pr uh, practices for their members so that they, instead of just being one farmer versus a big multinational company, it's a strong group of farmers that control many farms in one region bargaining together. And uh, so you can see uh, this is the fair trade uh, international logo that if it appears on a product, it is meant to have, uh, you know, meet, met standards for sustainability and treating workers fairly. And then some companies make fair trade part of their advertising.